Uh, right, our next speaker is Trevor, Trevor Pringle. Trevor is a registered architect and has been with Brands for over 25 years. You're a 30, so can I have a <laughs> no, he, can't. Um, he has worked in both the public and private sectors and is a former clerk of works. He uh, is now a principal writer with the brands and is a presenter at numerous brand seminars. Today, Trevor will cover several technical issues and good take detailing principles. Trevor, thank you. The stage is yours. I wasn't sure how many people we would actually have here tonight, so it actually is good to see these numbers, and thank you for the invite to actually come up and, uh, and speak to you. It's actually turned into quite a long week for me now, because I'm talking at the Certified Builders Conference on Saturday as well, so at least I've cheated a little bit, and something I'm going to talk about tonight is also what I'm going to talk to them about as well. As I said, I am a registered architect. Now, the question was asked, why am I cuddling a goat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cuddling a goat. It's a black sheep from Barbados, and I just like the photo. So I am an architect. As I say, I've worked in private firms, been a class of works. A little bit different from a number of architects that I've also worked on the tools as well. So I've renovated houses. I've actually worked for a builder building a house. And I'm coming up to getting my 30-year pin and braids. <laughs> so what I want to go through today and... I asked Phil what topics he wanted covered, and so he gave me a list, so I've sort of worked off some of those, but I'm quite happy that if you've got a topic you want to cover, I will try and answer if I can. Now, I've learned over the years that if it's something I don't know too much about, I will actually say. I won't try and get myself into a hole and then try and dig out of it. But we want to have a look a little bit at underlays. The question came up about timber windows. Who still specifies timber windows? <laughs> <laughs> so quite a few. New work or renovation work? Renovation. renovation work. And probably the other thing I need to know, who's primarily doing residential work? And those of you who haven't put up hands, some recent commercial work. A little bit? Or? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, gives me a better idea. So we'll have a look at some gaps, and I've taken that from the London Transport. One of the things that we see lots of issues with on buildings is ground levels, lack of clearances. So I just want to reiterate some of the rules that are around those. I want to have a look at this idea of Code Plus. Does anyone here think about Code Plus when they're designing? Anyone like to guess what I mean by Code Plus? Yeah. Exceeding the minimum. Exceeding the minimum. Because the thing we've got to keep in mind is that we get really focused on meeting building code compliance but building code compliance is just a minimum we can always do a lot better in a number of areas the other bit I want to cover which may be a little bit close to the bone in terms of what I will show as results is some survey work we did a number of years ago about the level of detail, the quality of the documentation that is actually being provided and there's some interesting feedback in that a little bit about products, and the other bit that was on the list is how do we actually go about doing something that's that little bit different? What are the steps we can take to ensure that when we go for that building consent, and we always want that building consent, we've actually got all our ducks lined up to ensure that it actually goes through the process relatively easy. Now I want to do a little straw poll, you don't have to answer this if you like. Can anyone give me the number of the maximum RFIs they've had on any one project? Fifty. Fifty. Sixty-nine. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was really pleased with ourselves the other day. My wife's also an architect, and we got a consent for a new house, and we got eleven. And I was really annoyed at that. I got rid of rid of nine of them over the phone, and it came down to two which I was really rather pleased with. But it is actually something that if we get our steps right as we go through the process, we should actually minimise the risk of having those RFIs, whether they're justified or not. And certainly some of them aren't necessarily justified. Which council is that? I can't possibly say. <laughs> no, it wasn't Auckland. I can't afford to build in Auckland. I wanted to look briefly at underlays. Now again getting your feedback in, 
Who still sticks with uh, the flexible wall underlying, whether it's opaque or, or a synthetic? Yes. Who's gone to move towards the rigid? <laughs> you. And who's taken the next step to go to the proprietary systems? So, the, and I noticed Lay was supposed to be here and I was going to give us some stick about their system, but I, I can't oh, see. Well, She's not here. Yeah. <laughs> You'll pass it on. <laughs> so, that we've got a lot of areas that we need to look at. And how many can recite Table 23 to me? It's a really key document. What acceptable solutions are there as guidance, and we can use them to <coughs> justify what we're doing, support what we're doing. Some aspects of the acceptable solutions actually give us really good information in terms of what we do need to achieve with certain products. It was talked about the treatment standard. That's another way we can actually show that this is what we want to achieve that building. So what Table 23 gives us all of those criteria there that a wall underlay needs to meet. Now the thing I see on site when I go around is that often the wall underlay is not really considered as being a component of our wall cladding system. I had a nice story the other day. I just happened to be sitting next to a wall underlay supplier on the plane coming up. And I mentioned this to him. It was here in Auckland. I don't know where. The builder was proudly telling the new owner of the house that he was building that he had great surety in his building because his cladding system was brands appraised. It had brands appraisal stamp on the wall underlay, but nothing more than that. So we do have to be cautious of how we do for most things. But our wall underlays are there as part of our cladding system. And it was one change in E2A as one back quite a few years ago now. Instead of just talking about cladding, it talked about a cladding system. And immediately some people said, well, it's not a system. We use a wall underlay from here and battens from here and then a cladding. What it's actually trying to get us to do is think about how that wall will work as a system when it's installed. And our wall underlay, whether it's a flexible or a rigid or a proprietary, is a key component of our detailing. Who's done a building here that's never leaked? <laughs> <laughs> they don't exist, do they? <laughs> they don't exist. It is. Sorry, am I moving about too much? You're going to have to work harder tonight. <laughs> they don't really exist. And a lot of the problems we had back pre-2005 was that buildings let water in, and buildings have always let water in, but they kept it in there. It didn't get out. It couldn't dry. It couldn't drain. It sat in there, it fermented, didn't necessarily have the treatment, although it's a byproduct. The fact that we couldn't keep the water out first was the actual issue. So our wall underlay system is an important component. Because in that really severe event, some water will get on that wall underlay. So it needs to be able to drain out. Might not happen very much, so that means that it does have a critical function. It does need to be installed properly. It does need to be installed without the tears or the rips or the billowing. And we've actually seen wall underlay that's bridging brick veneer cavities. So it's touching the back of the brick. And the back of the brick is going to be dry? No. So that water is actually being wicked across into our building. So we've got all of these things that we need to think about in terms of our spec. And this one is the key path. It's a way we can get that ultimate leak back down out of the building. If it was an old black building paper, it's not going to stand being wet for a long time, but it will deal with that bit of water that might actually get on it. So we have a standard. Who's got a copy of 2295? All right, we have a license with standards. I can just go online and bring them up. It's, it's nice and easy. Now, anyone want a copy? $35 from me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. So we have a standard. And the other thing that we need to think about is how we're building up our wall system. How many people here still do direct fix? Okay. One or two existing walls occasionally. I would always ask the question, why the hell are we still doing it? Because when a cavity so much better... But then there are some requirements according to our cladding system. 
because we will get some moisture behind there might be a little bit of condensation and if we're in the direct fix situation and our cannon does not have the ability to absorb or hold any moisture our wall underlay needs to perform that function so if we were using palisade direct fixing and i know generally it's done on the cavity we would need an absorbent wall underlay behind it once we put it on some battens space it off get some air movement through that absorbency factor doesn't come into play anymore so it can be any type so those are the things we're looking at in terms of how we might install our cladding system on our building it's actually interesting if we think back to when we first bought in cavities the first thing i heard from builders was and from a number of designers as well was ah, these bloody cavities i've got to put battens on i'm going to do this and it's going to take longer if you actually talk to those same people now they're actually saying the same thing about direct fix because doing flashings is harder fitting things in is harder cavities actually make things easier and give us a pretty good degree of safety in terms of how our building will perform when that water gets through it's going to drain it's going to dry the other thing really is about the installation and i'm probably a little bit biased I would probably question, if I was looking at a design for myself, using a flexible underlay, simply because of the difficulty in actually getting it tight, getting it holding that insulation in, because in Auckland here, you put in the maximum insulation in the walls, don't you? Some are nodding. But once we push that insulation in, it's very easy to push a flexible wall underlay across that drain and vented cavity. And once we do that, we've stopped its effectiveness. We might tape it. And what have our tapes got to be on our wall underlay? 300 centres, horizontally, or wire, or whatever. Now, that's not going on Facebook, those photos, are they? No, that's all right. There's an appearance fee. <laughs> it's all right. We, we did a seminar. I'll, I'll sidetrack a little bit. Did a seminar in Christchurch a couple of years ago, and someone tweeted mid-seminar that we didn't answer his question. Fortunately, he put his face on his Twitter account, and I, there he was, so I went and grabbed him at the break and said, what was your question that you wanted answered? He told me and I answered, and I said, you will now tweet that we've answered your question, won't you? <laughs> Modern technology has its benefits. So what I've tried to do here really is just summarise the considerations, because doing design is all about making decisions, isn't it? to do this or this, and we need to know what are the advantages of doing this or what are the drawbacks in doing that. And really what I'm doing here is just saying that certainly when you're working with a flexible and they're a perfectly valid way of doing it, there are some things we have to consider. Once we go to a rigid underlay, some of those become less of an issue. We get the bracing out of it. Now it gets a little bit more complicated because we have rigid underlay under 3604, so I'm not 3604, get my documents right, under E2AS1, but it's just a fibre cement sheet or a plywood sheet. Nothing's done to the joints, so we then put a flexible wall underlay over the top of it to be that drainage path. Once we go the next step and go to the Hardy's or the Ecoply barrier system, they're actually a proprietary system. They're actually a drainage system or a weather, not a weather type system, but a weatherization system in their own right. They have some ability to deal with moisture. The joints are taped or flashed, so it gives us the opportunity to effectively close in our building that much quicker. So there are a number of benefits. The drawbacks, though, if it's a drawback, is that we have to do exactly what they want the right tapes, the right flashings, because we go and use this product with this one and it's not part of the system, are they gonna back it up when it's a problem? No. So we have to be quite specific about what we use for them. So they're a proprietary system, follow those instructions. It gives the same benefits, just an ordinary rigid underlay, but a little bit more resistance to actually moisture. And, as I see it, the advantages of a rigid underlay, whether it's proprietary or otherwise, is that we hold in the insulation, we get that bracing. 
we're better able to ensure that when our building's complete, our cavity is going to be open, it's going to drain, and it's going to dry. Can't necessarily guarantee that with a flexible. The other reason why those underlays are really important is around pressure moderation. Anyone going to tell me what I really mean by pressure moderation? When we look at our buildings, the way water gets into them is actually via air movement. So they're pressure differences. They're a bit like the maps we look at at TV. So today in Auckland, you probably had quite high pressure over the harbour, so the fog sat there, and it didn't move. We had no flow from that high to the low. A building is exactly the same. The outside is usually higher, and the inside is usually lower in pressure. So we're going to get an airflow from the high to the low, just like a weather map. And if we create a path, and then there's some water there as well, that water gets taken immediately into the building. So having an air pressure barrier, or an air barrier, as part of our system is critical to the performance of a wall cladding system. We want to stop having a pressure drop across that wall. How we might do it, we can use our air barriers, whether it's a rigid on the outside. How many of you do use the proprietary EcoFly or Hardy's? So you're taking that pressure on the outside of your framing. Much of what we build, actually that pressure is taken on the plasterboard on the inside. And what we end up then is with the space in the framing where the insulation is, the drainage cavity, all at about the same pressure. And so we don't get that moisture transference through it. The other critical factor then is our air seals. So what we do around our windows. So a number of years ago we had a film crew out of Brands and we were showing them what we do in our little weather tighter films. It's quite a small one. And we had a window system, cladding system under test and it was performing incredibly well. No water was actually getting through. There were no air leakage paths. We then deliberately put a hole in the air seal around the window. And apologies to the ladies. It was actually like one of the gentlemen here standing behind there after he'd had a few beers. <laughs> the water effectively came through like a spurt. Once we created that pressure drop across the wall. And it was actually drawing water up the cavity and through this hole. So getting that integrity of our air barrier around our building is critical to its performance in terms of weather tightness. Uh, who's, yeah, you've got a bottle, haven't you? Mm -hmm. how, how much have you got in it? Eight. I want you to put that stand up. Yep. <laughs> didn't tell you it's going to be a show like this, did I? I want you to blow into the bottle. Yep. Yep. And keep blowing. No, no, really blow. Oh, my mouth over it. Yep, really blow. Yeah, Come on, keep, keep going. You're not reading up yet. <laughs> okay, you can't actually blow any more in, can you? No. So what's actually happened in the bottle is that... I won't say you're a wind bag. <laughs> the pressure in there from you blowing is exactly the same as the pressure you can generate. Okay. So that's pressure equalisation or pressure moderation. Yeah. And that's what we want across our wall. I'd love to have, no one's got a plastic bottle, do they? Have you got a red bottle? No, I can't do it anyway. <laughs> if I was to put a hole in that bottle, on the bottom, and you kept blowing, you'd be blowing all day. Because that pressure can't build up in that bottle, and because there's still some beer in it, that beer would start spraying out through that hole as well, mm. which is how we get it out. <coughs> so if we try and... Isn't the same thing if you just open the window? It's going to equal the pressure on both sides it, it, of the wall. It opens the... Yes, it does. It actually brings you the pressure up inside to more the outside. Or vent the window. Yeah. But the thing is that usually we don't open them when it's really heavy rain, and so we don't bring the air in. But there is a, a philosophy of weather tightness, which is reverse pressure. And we use that in labs. So if you actually pressurise something to more than atmospheric pressure, you stop things coming in as well. So yes, it will do. And you probably see in old timber windows on a really windy day, you'll get it in. And I saw it some years ago on a house. I was asked to have a look at. The house had been fined for about 10 years. Corrugated steel cladding, no cavity. 
but that gets a lot of air movement through it. And in a really gentle Wellington nor'wester, there was some water coming in under a bottom plate, in the middle of the wall, proper overhang at the bottom, good clearance from the ground. Why is this happening? It's got the 50 cover, and then someone went and opened the back door, which effectively dropped the pressure in the house a little bit more, and some more water came in. And what we actually found, corrugated iron's great, and corrugated steel, because you just unscrew the panel, had a look at the wall, and there was a little dip in the slab under the bottom plate. And the pressure difference was enough to have the water run down the corrugate, back up 50 mils, and in under the bottom plate. Easy to fix, bit of that wonderful stuff that expands into place, and you block the air gap. And you'll see it even around outward opening aluminium doors. <coughs> You can get some suction pressures on those, you'll get some air coming in. So it's, it's all about that pressure drop and trying to actually control that. And if we control it, then we stop the water coming into the building most of the time. And our options, as I said, it could be the plasterboard inside, it could be a rigid area, but it's just where we take that pressure. Anyone here use, and I'm not advertising them, but the smart fit windows from Fletcher's? Yep, they work. Done one? They do it a little bit differently because you actually put on generally a rigid air barrier, you then screw a flange to them, so all of your rear pressure is taken at that face because they don't require air seals between the reveal and the rest of it, do they? No. So that's where they're taking the pressure in that system. Generally, when it's raining, it's a low pressure system, so the pressure outside is actually. Yeah, it's still higher than that inside the building. The only time that it actually reverses is on a Ruby Cotton night and the house pressure can, because you warm it up a bit, yeah. can be a bit higher inside, but generally it's lower inside than outside, irrespective of the actual air pressure. Because you get that little bit of wind and it just creates that difference. So that's air barriers, and we talked about air seals. This one here, you probably... So, just one more question, what you're saying is if you put a rigid air barrier on in the system, you actually have to do it perfectly. Pretty much. And whether that rigid air barrier is your plasterboard, it could be a flexible wall underlay that meets specific air tightness requirements, or it could be one of your proprietary systems. And <coughs> we've even seen water being brought up and through in a really severe situation where you get a power point next to a corner, water actually being drawn in because there was a path to bring it in. So it's looking at those paths and trying to get rid of them. And, and we can never be perfect, but they need to be as good as possible. And people have said, when we do an air seal like this one, you know, what gap can I get away with? Really, you shouldn't be getting away with any gaps because it's a potential weakness. So they need to be continuous. And it's a bit harder because we have to trim the, the packers in a little bit so we can get that seal to go around it. And I don't know, you've probably seen it. I've seen it. The windows are not quite right or they're jammed down one end. And even if they fitted hard on the trimming studs on one side and a 5 mil gap on the other, it's almost impossible to get your rear seal in that little gap. So it's getting that even gap around the windows as well. Any more questions on those? How am I going? Sure. In um, your opinion, did the air test, you know, actually completely seal the house up? Oh, yeah. test, are we getting towards that? Or we, you know, we, you know, we're we're heading, it's a of insulation and like, Here at Auckland, 
windows don't get opened, people are working more, so houses are shut up for longer. Someone likes to say it's back in the old days when you know things like the sexist, but mum stayed at home and had the doors open, hung the washing outside. And if you walk around some of the apartment blocks not far from here, how many of those houses have people drying their laundry inside? <coughs> And I'm getting off my topic, but it's, it's quite an important one. So as we make houses more airtight, so plasterboard linings, <coughs> out of windows, board floors, tight stock corners, we've taken out all those default ventilations that used to occur, and we do need to then incorporate ventilation and hopefully incorporate it in a way that the occupants use it without really knowing they're using it. So we do run on fans. <coughs> I've always said that I thought a human in the stack in the bathroom was a much better idea. I've been told some of them are not actually that reliable. But if you've got a reliable humidistat that senses when it's too damp and operates, that's much better than getting someone to switch on the fan and then either leave it on too long or not use it because it's noisy. So we do have to ventilate spaces in our new buildings. And it's part of, I think, what our job should be as designers. We have to educate our clients how they should actually live in their houses. So giving them a little booklet or something about opening windows or like I love passive ventilators. And I, my last house had them built into my window system and they were just open all the time. And I never had a moisture problem. Never been painted in the time we lived there, which was 16 years. I mean never. No, I kind of like we did have mold in one bathroom. Because so I had one daughter that would not leave her vents open. The other daughter did and that bathroom was fine. So I'm sort of sold on the passive ventilator and, and natural fumes for us. When we're doing alterations um, to existing buildings, the, um, the new part has got to be out to the standard. Yes. Is this going to cause an accelerated problem with the old parts? Um, <laughs> or have you not sort of done much testing on that? We haven't, as far as I'm aware, done much testing on how it does, but it depends on, I guess, how much that old part of the house gets shut off from the new part. So older houses, the end of climate up here is not quite as severe as other parts of the country, so you probably get away with it at least than other parts. But it's one of the things, building regulations have never been made to be totally retrospective. So if you do an alteration, you've got to upgrade everything. So you're always going to have that dichotomy where some parts actually work better than others, and I think that's just a fact of life of living in the houses. We can do a lot if we're relining to put insulation in and so on. But again, if we reline an old villa, we've made it a lot more airtight, then that ventilation becomes more important if we do put new windows in. So it's, it's part of an education with our owners, really. We can't bring everything up to scratch totally. How am I going for time? Six o'clock, half an hour. Half an hour? Oh, I feel like we're out already. <laughs> right, the other question was about timber windows. When you put your hands up, what if you were using timber windows? So when you asked it, did you have a specific issue? Because I wasn't sure. No, I didn't have a specific issue. It's just that it's not really covered only the right. one. Yep. So, you know, it's an alternative solution. Right. Um, and so just the best way to approach it. Best way to approach it, Okay. I'll use slightly different terminology because I don't use the term alternative solution. You'll find Brands doesn't use it either. It's a subtle little thing that they didn't think of that an alternative solution only becomes such when the council accepts it as another way of doing it. So we use the term alternative method. So it's another way of doing it. If the council says, yes, we believe it's going to comply and give you your consent, then it becomes an alternative solution for that specific project. I've got some drawings here for timber windows. Anyone using the JMF profiles? Because I think McNaughton's up here still make it. So we're still using conventional profiles? Yeah. So we do have the standard, the 3617. There's also Brands Bulletin, and to our chagrin a little bit, it got cited in the acceptable solution, which means we have to keep it. There's Bulletin 411, which also has profiles that are considered to be acceptable for weatherboards. The other standard there is the profile one. I got off track a little bit. This is for our window sections. So if we're using windows that are following that section, 
we may have beefed them up a little bit because if we're going to put double glaze, we do double glazing up here? I've heard you don't. Yeah. It's too warm. No. You have to beef them up a little bit because you're taking a fair bit of the guts out of a timber sash section to put some double glazing in. But that gives us our section that we use and that's our biggest ally. That standard's been around probably longer than I have. And I think there's one or two here might be a little bit older than me and probably remember it coming in. So that's a standard, those sections have been accepted as working for a number of years. So that's our first bit. We're using sections that have that tried and true history of performance. We might add some ear seals and we might add some other bits to it. These are going to be a little bit faint, but I'll actually bring <coughs> them up. But the other thing we can take from E2AS1 is some of the principles of it. We're not following <coughs> it, but if we follow the principles. Does this make sense? Sort of? That's oh, making sense. So we have ear seals. Can we put ear seals around timber windows? Yeah. Usually pretty easily. Can we incorporate flexible flashing tape across the sill of a window? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we take the E2AS1 direct fixed details for an aluminium window that use that extra batten down the trim opening to allow us to take our flashing right across? So there's our argument, isn't it? We used to have the um, corner soakers. We yeah, and we used to cut out the trimming studs mm -hmm. by putting that extra batten in and then actually just put a standard seal tray across and it's a lot easier. I like to think there was actually brand's detail that MB stole. <coughs> Pay us for it either. <laughs> but a lot of what we need to do is actually in E2AS1, we're just using it slightly differently. And that's really our supporting of it. And certainly the brand's details, which I'll put up, we still show a timber, not a timber um, metal silt tray flasher in front of them, just as a backup if some water comes down the side of the timber, goes in behind the facings, we've got that silt tray to pick it up and bring it back to the so outside. Use the cool side as well. Uh, don't use the corner soak, but we do do a fold up on the end because it's hard against your trimming studs and it picks up that water that's likely to come into that junction. And we've got to think about what are the critical bits. So it's where we might miter a facing, so we need to have some drainage down behind it and we need to get that water out at the bottom. So what I like to think of in terms of details, I'll use, I'll use your banner here, it's easier than my drawing. Where's water going to impact onto our opening here and how are we going to deal with it. How are we dealing with it on the face? So in this case we've got a deflection device across the top, so any water things not much going to get on there because the edge is deflecting and protecting it as well. But some water's going to get onto there, it'll run down there and then it'll run down the face of the opening. If some water does drive in behind our scribers, then there's usually a gap behind there, it will cling to the back of that surface as long as we don't have any pressure drop across it it will run down, it will be caught by the flashing at the bottom and directed back out to the outside. So how I like to think about details first is not the mechanics of it totally, but is where's water going to impact on it? <coughs> where's it going to go? If it gets in, how am I getting it back out again? And the best way I've seen it done was for a multi-storey building in Wellington. I did a peer review on some documents. <coughs> and what he'd done is a little... Anyone like Arlo Guthrie? Hmm? Remember it's circles and arrows on the 42 8x10 colour glossy photos? Circles and arrows are really good little tools that we can use to show to that consent official how our detail is going to work. So water's going to come here, it's going to drain down here, it's going to come back out here. The air's going to come in here, we might use a red line and a blue line, red for air, blue for water, and illustrate the principle of the detail to them. Because the biggest fault, and probably why we get most of the RFIs, is that we do something different, but we don't give them a little bit of information around why it's different and why it's going to work. It's telling them this is different, and it's going to work because. And I thought these little arrows, it was more a cladding system, it was eight storeys up, it just happened that the design wind loads on that eight storey building in central Wellington. Anyone know Wellington well? Know the houses up on the top of Kandala? 68 meters per second design wind speed. That's extra, 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 extra high. And the wind speed on this eight story building in Cuba Street was actually much lower. And it's also one of those things, I looked at a set of drawings for a house on that hill, 
And I thought, this is really good. They followed all the E2A as one details. The upstands were right, the covers were right. And then I looked at the design wind speed. And those details are designed for a certain level of wind speed, not 68 meters per second. So I gave up then and said, you, should, you do some details that are going to work in that wind speed. So it might have been more cover, might have been bigger upstands. There are a number of ways we could have done it. So if we look at it in detail, three, five. Well, then I put that one in. It's all right, it'll come back to me. There are things we can do to our timber windows to make them perform a bit better. We can go to slightly bigger sash sections that allow us to put in a double blazer unit. These are the old ones. We can add our draft stripping. Because the biggest problem with our timber windows is they still are drafty. And already there's a range of proprietary seal systems we can use around our sashes to make them that bit more airtight. But again, if we're doing something, we can actually use maybe the house down the road from the new one you're designing. And you can say, well, this is the same environment. Our windows are the same way. We've got the same sort of facings. And this has been working so Proven history of use is a very good way of substantiating what we want to do into the future. So there's a number of things we can do. The other one that's important is this one here. I use my brother, don't tell him I've said this, but he had these nice cedar French doors done. They didn't seal the rebates properly before they put the glass in. They never stopped leaking. So it's sealing rebates, making sure that, because cedar's going to be really absorbent, going to hold that moisture, it won't necessarily rot, but it will hold the moisture and it will, once it creates a path in, and you think if you've got a little gap around a piece of glass into a timber window, there's a potential air leakage path there as well, there's a gap. It's actually sealing it to ensure that we keep that water on the outside face. So we quite often see those rebates not sealed. So coming to some details. You can sort of read them. So that's the uh, standard timber details. That one has a weather head, which I actually quite like the detail because it's adding a deflection device to it. And I talk about deflection. Who knows about the four Ds? They are deflection, durability, durability coming out of Canada. But if we look at this one here, if we use this here, this becomes part of our deflection. This one is on a cavity, so this is our drainage out and our gaps. The little kick out on the end of our heat flash in here again is part of our deflection. We're getting that water away from those critical junctions. And then we have the back up in here as some water drives in. Outward opening windows and doors are always going to be that little bit trickier to do. Sorry. Are easier to do. It's the inward opening ones that are actually the trickier ones because you see all the little in the reverse. So if we look at that, that's pretty much an old window detail. What we've added in is turning in our wall underlay, tapering or an extra layer, and the air seal in the back. So it's pretty much the same as an E2AS1 detail, it's just a different window section. And we can use the same for PVC windows or steel windows if we're actually using those as well. And even the alternative way, I don't really like this detail particularly, it's relying much more just on that junction and getting that heat flash in there right. But again, it's still following those basic <coughs> principles of where the water's coming from, where we're draining it to. If it gets in, how do we pick it up down the bottom at our sill with a sill tray going across and our tape taken in. But how do we get an air seal in around the bottom? But you still have the option of something like a strip of in-seal foam just under your sillboard before it goes in. And as long as that's continuous with what's around the edge of it, we've got that air seal around it. And we won't stop totally the air that will come in around this. But even if a bit of water drives in through there, it's caught by that tray and it's taken back out again. So all quite simple principles, but again, it's, it's a history of use that we've had for a number of years. And then there are other options at the head, whether we use our facings. Tricky part with these is the junction where we turn from the horizontal down to the vertical, whether we might or it will take it across. Uh, just making sure that that is actually sealed and we deal with the water that's going down. 
and then the, the jam itself. You can't get anything much safer than this, really, can you? We've got a good cover to the reservoirs. We've got a good seal here. That's probably more than we have to have as an aluminium flange across a piece of reservoir. And again, the air seals, and this is that extra little piece of timber here. We've just shown that it's one. It could be wider. As long as it stops short of your silk trimmer, then that flashing can go right across the whole width of it. Turn up the ends, turn up the back, and water will be taken out. So nothing really new, it's just using what we have in other areas and all we've done with these details, these are part of the brand's details, is just apply those things that E2AS1 requires to the timber windows. And we tend to increase our flashing depths in that a little bit as well. And even with a double hung window, it's not quite so clear here, but we still have the option within these of getting air seals and at this point we can get an air seal in the back here and we can do it down the side, even those that have the little box pieces where your weights go down, there's usually enough there that you can actually get an air seal around those as well. So we can start to get some better performance. And if we want some more info, this is my advertorial. Brands Details, anyone <coughs> use Brands Details? Yeah? yeah. We're just working on those, because they're getting quite old. There's some frustrations of working with contractors sometimes. We've actually converted <coughs> fair number of them to native Revit format, so they're going to be much more usable when we release them, and it's just getting the process of getting them all converted and redrawn, checked as we go through. But what we're doing for all of them, for every detail, there'll be four or maybe six 3D sequenced drawings. So it will show the framing, this goes on, this goes in, this goes in, to build up the picture for the head. Jam, sill jam. So when you buy your timber window detail office in the future, you will get your head jam sill, as one said, <coughs> with an associated 12 drawings that show the construction sequence. But the 2Ds will be manipulable. But just remember that if you change our detail, it's not our detail anymore. So those are the resources. Also our renovate books because they're really good at recording how houses might have been built in the past. And who uses Brands Find? One, two, it's a, I'm biased. It's a really, really good tool. So you go onto our website, it's by the helpline. If you go into Brands Find, it's a metadata search engine. And if you're not sure, you think you might have seen something in Build Magazine or something I wrote, you can just search by my surname and it will bring up all the articles I've written. Be ready to sit there for a long time. But it's a really good search tool if you're not quite sure what you actually remember seeing or, or build online as well. This one, I've had quite a lot of questions about terminating a DPM. So when you're doing an edge stick and slab or your, you're mainly rough slabs up here anyway, aren't you? Yes, I'm is flat, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. I've been to Hobson for a point. D4s can make any site flat, but it is the trend more that we don't get sites. But it's where we terminate the damp proofing under our slab. And we see lots of people still doing it the way we used to do it years ago, which, if we follow that, probably makes it worse in some instances. So I just want to go through some details that we might actually use around the edge of the slab to ensure that we get the level of weather, or not really weather, but waterproofing that we require and without making it too complicated. I don't know how many of you used the edge insulation detail. This is a revised one because the engineers didn't like our old one. A lot of people didn't like it either. There's some timber in there. But if you're doing the more traditional ring foundation and a slab inside it, then all we need to do is take the damp proofing along here and turn it up through this junction, whether it's got that little insulation layer in there or not. And usually that termination will be hidden just at the edge of the framing and some linings and skirtings. Although someone's talking about not having skirtings, then we've got to make sure it gets in the right place. That's the easiest way of terminating it. And then any moisture that might impact on the outside here isn't going to get into it. Because we see a lot of slabs, and it used to be quite common to actually pour the slab right over the top of your ring foundation, 
and all you saw poking out the edge here was the edge of the polythene. It wasn't necessarily that well vibrated either, so it was a very good moisture path into the edge of that slab. So we need to terminate it there. If we are doing an edge thickened slab, just been doing these in my new house, all we need to do is bring it to this point here. You've probably seen lots of older houses where you used to bring it up the face of that foundation wall. Never stuck there, fell out a bit, it filled up with water, and it actually made it worse. So the only time you would consider doing anything on this space is on a very wet site. And if your concrete is actually well vibrated, it's dense, it's consistent, we make water tanks out of concrete. So it's not actually going to draw up much water anyway. It's not going to have any hydrostatic pressure on it, which can be done with the slab. So we just need to terminate it at the bottom of the trench. It doesn't need to come up anywhere at all. I haven't got edge insulation on that, no. And Edge insulation is an interesting conundrum in that we've done some details, they're not perfect. But it's one of those things, to try and do it properly is incredibly difficult. And we've got our next seminar series starting, which is Brands Artists' 17, and we're trying to look at how much heat loss goes out through the edge of a slab. And generally the heat loss from any floor is about 80% of it's through that edge, but if it's a heated floor, obviously the amount is much more, but the proportions are about the same. The problem with the outside insulation is keeping it dry and protecting it from damage. And if you're going to put, say, on that one, put, oops, go back, went the wrong way. Put 40 mm of poly on the outside there, or 25, which is probably enough. You might have got to flash it over the top, and I know I've shown you a drawing that's a direct fix plan, but you still want to get that flashing at the top of it so you get the water out, or you go to a wider plate and cantilever it out, and then take your insulation underneath it. But what we've found in some research we're doing, we built a new building at Brands, and we used a range of different insulation materials around the outside. We pulled one up the other day, I think it was a polyisocyanate foam, and it was like a wet sponge. So it was actually sucking moisture out, sucking moisture, absorbing moisture and sucking heat out of the slab. So they need to be kept dry. So we're actually saying in the bulletin on edge insulation, we can wrap it in polythene and have it like encapsulated insulation and then protect it, it will perform much better. What do we use to protect it? Parties don't say that you should put their product in the ground because ultimately it will degrade. A former colleague of mine some years ago did one of the polyblock edge insulations and he was going to just put some big porcelain tiles and set them into the ground to protect it because we need to stop the UV getting to the poly because otherwise it will degrade. If we put some flute board or something, you come along with your weed eater and something and you're, you're smacking it apart. So there's no perfect solution yet. And even the little one with the insert, the actual R value on that is much lower than 25 mm of poly on the outside. So we can make it better. We haven't yet got a perfect detail. We actually need someone to come up with a product. And I think you could now. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's one where you actually get a poly that's actually pre hard coated. Yes. And you can put that on and then paint it. Yeah. So people are actually thinking about coming up with solutions. Quarter of an hour to go. Quarter of an hour to go. Speed up. Speed up. Right. Well, we don't need to cover that one. The other one is where we're below grade. And some of you have been to seminar might have seen this before. Of footing. Who uses tidy concrete? Tidy slabs? I think they're the best thing going because it gives a good platform to work from. When we form the edge, don't take away your boxing. Leave it there and fold your damp proofing up. And then when you do your wall, you can come down with your stick on, something that will stick to the polythene, and you've got a whole width of polythene that it's actually in good condition to stick to. So we just leave the boxing in there for a bit longer, then once we waterproof the wall, then we do the junction. And we've got a better chance, because it's actually this junction here is the critical bit where we come down the wall with whatever we've brought up under the slab. 
and then this detail here has a much better chance of working in conjunction with the drainage. Gaps. I've seen too many painters fill up gaps that are meant to be left open. So these are good gaps. They're gaps that need to stay there because they're essential to the performance of a cladding. So it's drainage, it's allowing drying. Some of these, um, they're good gaps, but not well done. And then we have some bad gaps. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me wonder about this industry sometimes. That one's a bad gap because it's not big enough. If you do a horizontal fixing block in a cavity, it's got to be a 50 gap at the end, not a, a 6 or 8 one. I've actually said that plumbers should be banned from owning chainsaws. Probably they should be banned from owning skill saws. The architrave is supposed to actually go down to the carpet. So there are some bad gaps as well. The other thing around is gaps that we seal. Who uses sealant or specifies sealant? You do? Yeah. You ensure that we're actually using it right. And how many times have you been on site? And you see the guy coming down with the gun, he's pulling it through. Even the ads on TV show them installing sealant wrong. You should always run, I can't tell on this one, I think he's actually doing it wrong, he's pulling it. And if you pull it, you stretch it, you get air bubbles. You should always work over the sealant you've applied and up the joint. So next time you go on the site, Wear your hard hat and tell the guy he's doing it wrong. Because you'll get air bubbles and it won't properly fill the joint. And then it's actually getting those dimensions right and getting the profile of the sealant right. Because if we don't get the thin waste on it, well, when it's a joint taking up the movement, or we get three-sided adhesion, the joint is going to fail. It needs to be two-sided adhesion only, and it should always be much thinner in the middle. Unless you're dealing with something like a 6 or a 7.5 fibre cement, we have the bond breaker tape at the back so that it's only sticking to the sides and then it will actually take up the movement. If you adhere it on three sides, all it does is fracture down the middle. It can't actually take up the movement. And, I don't know, I've been at great pains in doing a new house and I was very specific right down to the vanities and everything. It was all specified for the builder. There isn't any sealant joints. Oh no, there's a couple inside the edge of tiles going around. And how many of you actually specify the sealant that's going to be used in your joints? You do? Yeah. So we need to know about what we're specifying and where we're going to use it. And getting the profile of it correct, because that's critical to the performance. It was interesting, I did some training with that company called Main Zeal a few years back. And did the first one here, and Peter Gong, who was the CEO at the time, came to my first presentation and his first question is why do we still use sealant in critical locations? There are other ways we can do joints which are usually better. Not saying sealants are bad, they're good as air seals, keep them away from UV, but we've gone away from other things we used to use like open drain joints and the like which don't necessarily rely on the sealant. Ground clearances, we all get those right? Nice comment some years ago when a Cladding manufacturer said, I don't have a problem with my cladding too close to the ground. I do have a problem with the ground too close to my cladding. <laughs> uh, Twelve townhouses, the RL of the floors was all wrong, so they had to go and lower the whole site. So it's stopping that moisture being absorbed, it bounces inwards, suspended floors, we need to have space for the vents and the like. So we need to ensure that we get those clearances, we allow the drainage to occur. Trevor, can you just go back to this diagram? You know, say that the thing out has the vertical dimensions and it's on the side and speckers, there's no horizontal dimensions. And it's a contentious issue because you... Oh, no, they're all, oh, that's quite clear they're vertical. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, the diagram, you go inside the garage door, it's how far you start the driveway. Garage doors are a totally different yeah. thing. Why do we give cars the best space in the building usually? It's just that part where the 50 overlap is yeah. weathering. It's yeah. almost... Hard to achieve. It's very, very hard to achieve to do with garage doors. And either you use nibs or... The other way that... Which I've done on our house is that the ramp up to our garage door is only the width of the jams. 
So we can actually bring our ramps in a little bit because our car's not going to drive right to the edge, is it? So if we've got a jam there, we can actually have the side of our ramp there and we get away from that problem. But we tend to make the ramps the same woods. Yeah. So it's all in this document and those dimensions are all there for it. But it is a common issue that we actually see. This machine here had all the GPS on it, levels and everything. And when it was asked how it worked, the guy said, I don't know, I've got a good eye. <laughs> <laughs> so these are our other clearances depending on our finishing. This one here, I didn't take this photo, but Colleen did. He asked the guys how they worked out where those little paving slabs were going to be. And they said, mate, are you stupid? I said, this is the ground level, the paving's this thick, this is where it finishes. <laughs> Uh -huh. They didn't have any idea about the fact that they actually need a certain dimension from the bottom of that paving to the top of those paving. So again, it's part of the education of actually doing it. And yes, these details become very hard to meet all of the requirements with the cover. So maybe we do have to think about nibs in behind there so that we can keep our cladding up. But then the client's going to say, oh, but I want that to line up. Well, sometimes we've got to change that. The other one. one. One question: If you were building this, can you go along to the site and we cut the site out 300 and finish floors about 100 below the two sides of the section? What would you say to the building? Well, you do have the option of providing drainage around the building, or you have to lower the rest of it. Yeah, but when you when you lower this, there's a section. <coughs> yeah, I know. Right somewhere it is, but it's cut 300 feet. The floors actually lie the two ground levels yeah. on each side. I know. And some guys signed it off. I know. It's very hard to get the perfect building inspector. <laughs> Edge distances. You all check these. Those bolts hold down anchors you've specified. You know what the edge distance is. You know they will actually fit within your 90 bottom plate. Some will don't. They only work with 140 plates. So again, it's just another one of those things. And when we're dealing with header blocks, we're actually looking at the amount of concrete that's in there, not the dimension from the outside. Because if you put this bolt too close to there, it's just going to spool that off completely. And uh, again, you probably anyone see the Auckland City Council video of that house mm -hmm. over on the North Shore that none of the anchors actually went into anything solid? <laughs> if we get them too close to the edge, we effectively just blow them off. So check what the requirements are before you specify. And Again, as I say, these are actually Auckland photos that I took. It makes me wonder sometimes why we see a bar there and all sorts of other things. But post-fixed answers, their specific testing, you need the data, you need that edge distance information. And what do we actually use? I actually like screw bolts. Good reason is that when you actually wind them up, you don't actually put any outward force on the actual concrete. So like an expanding anchor can actually <coughs> pop up. There is one rule with screw bolts, so if you're specifying them, tell the builder he needs a new drill. Because mm. if you use an old one, they're not going to go in very easy. And don't let them over torque them, because you can wind the heads off them. So about 45 to 55 kilopascals, or newton metres, or whatever it is, the figure and we need to meet within that. 3604 talks about casting anchors. Anyone using those? Still using casting. Gee, the places must love you when they come to it. <laughs> so those requirements are there. The screw bolts, I, they just make it that much easier to be able to do it than later, but it is important that we don't over talk them. We have the right drill. They put less stress on the concrete. And some of the new power tools that we've got they actually wind it up far too much, they're far too tight, and so we need to pull back on the torque on them when we're actually listening to them. <coughs> and as I say, the brand, two of brands of praised ones, those, those are the torque <coughs> ones. And this was, I'm going to talk to this about, to this builders about this, but it's really just some of the other things too, is when you're specifying them, Tell them to make the hole a bit deeper so that dross sits in the bottom and doesn't stop you actually 
when the bowl hit the properly. And yes, you can pull them out, but you've got to be very careful when you put them back in that you put the threads back in the same place again, because if they cut a second through, they have no near the whole thing. What's your view on the epoxy ones? On epoxy ones, again, if they've been tested and they've got the data to show they work, uh, they're fine. The only thing with anything with epoxy is make sure there's no water around when you do them because the water will actually stop the epoxy going off. And to give an example, some years ago when I was a clerk and worked, we built some piers to put a cable climber on the outside of the building. And I knew I was going to be in that thing a bit later. And we had hoop bars and a pier. And I tried to figure a way of actually testing the bond into the concrete. And at that time, I was a little bit lighter, but I was about 95 kilos, so I worked out if I got a really big scaffold pole and jumped on the end with about a 3 to 1 foot. That was about the uplift load that would be on those bars. And much to the site foreman's disgust, I popped two of them. One, because they hit a bar and only went in that far. And the second one had been contaminated with water, and it actually had no holding power at all. So, yes, we fixed it, and it was okay. So, just quickly, we've got a couple of minutes. I might not get to my alternative solutions, but the question is very good. We've got a couple of minutes. I thought this was good. Some of you may have read about some of this. We had a look at the plans and specs for 53 new houses in four locations. 26 of those sets we randomly selected at the BCA, and the others we put back on site. This is good. 85% we can actually read them. And this surprised me that it actually said from the people that inspected them for us that drawings were logical, which hopefully they are, and complex junctions have been well detailed. Most are usually the ones we leave out, aren't they? <laughs> but 40% didn't have the right amount of information. To get a little story, a colleague looked at some drawings independently. And then it's a very simple little house. He read the spec and it had spec clauses for nine cladding types, <laughs> none of which we used on the house. <laughs> and there's still some work to do around clarity. And the other one here is when we refer to something else, I like having that information with the documentation rather than saying go and look here. And I had an argument with a tiler one day, sorry, I had an argument with a designer. She said, it's all right for me to specify the tiling standard. And I said, do you expect the tiler to have that standard and know it? He said, yes. I said, have you got a copy? He didn't actually know what was in the standard that he was telling the tiler to do. So how can you actually then check it? And this one worries me. And I've said a number of times, there's one company I would love to have shares in. It's that company called Selected. We've probably all done it. Selected membrane, selected timber treatment, selected wall underlay. They have a whole range of products. If you're going to write selected, why can't you write their name or the wall underlay name? Be specific about what you actually want to be used, and then you don't have an argument later if they put in something which is still a wall underlay, but it's not the one you were thinking of. You should generate some other variation. Well, if you do it up front, it should be fine, and then you put it in your speed. But if you want pricing of a different material, you supply that to me as an alternative. Yeah, we don't have a lot of holes or sway over what the building decides to do with this part. And that's so I mean, they yeah, have and that's different material. The other yeah. problem with our industry, how many are actually involved in contract observation? A few. And that's really sad, isn't it? A builder's out there building your masterpiece and you have no idea what he's doing. <laughs> well, you might not want to have any idea. Unfortunately, we do find out we've got a problem. <laughs> I'll do this one as the last one and then we can move on. The other bit I really wanted, and I won't get to the alternative solution stuff, but what we're talking about there is actually setting a compliance path. And I'll jump to the last slide just to do that. I'd like to see you taking on a more code plus and it's working with your client and saying, mm -hmm. these are minimums that we can actually do better. Maybe make windows a bit smaller, because there's just been a study published at Otago University saying we're making houses much bigger, but the thermal performance is actually dropping off. <coughs> because the convoluted slabs, the bigger windows, 
might put a bit more insulation on the right, given the great bin of the other. So better insulation going to your, your rigidity of areas on windy sites. That should be IGUs there rather than IGS. Up in the speak on that double glazing, going to a thermally broken window. And again, there's lots of things we can add to make our job a little bit better. It's not going to the gold plate taps, but it is making sure we know the provenance. And there's a little bit down the bottom there. Go on to our website, there's some information there under an area called Upspec, and it actually puts some figures around the benefit versus cost of actually doing this in better things. Thank you. <laughs> 